Hello and welcome to another review here on the channel. I want to come across as not mean and not aggressive as possible for this review because I've recorded this several times and upon playing it back, I seem like a jerk almost every time. So I'm trying to, trying to reel it in, pull it back to the chest. But boy, is this now my new least favorite fantasy book of all time. Outdoing both Cursed Child and Wizard's First Rule. Congratulations! Now, every time I do a crazy negative review like this, I have to feel the need to add the put the comment because people feel the need to put their comments about <laughs> This is just my opinion. It doesn't have to necessarily reflect your own. We're allowed to have different opinions. Hell, I have friends that love books I hate and hate books I love, and we're still good buddies. So, sit down, listen, and Try to understand why I criticize this. Or if you love it and you don't want to hear negative criticism, that's fine too. But this might be the most ranty video I have ever done because I have so much to say. When crafting a story, especially a fantasy story, a genre that's plagued with tropes and cliches, it's important that if you're going to rely on some of those ideas to do something interesting with them. Go outside the box, put a little lemon zest in that formula. Robert Newcomb, the author of The Fifth Sorceress, has decided to do literally none of that and instead just read like the cliff notes for a couple other fantasy books and just runs with the ideas here. Don't believe me? Let's get into the setup. So here we are in a magical fantasy world. We open in a prologue where some evil sorceresses are being banished and they talk about how there's going to be a fifth sorceress. Ha <laughs> we'll return someday. Why they don't execute them? Basically because boners. That's really it. It's disappointing. Moving on. We fast forward several hundred years and we meet our main character, Tristan, who manages to not be a total cliche. I'm gonna give you that credit, Robert. He's not a complete cliche because he's not a farm boy. Ah, instead, he's a prince who has royal magic blood that makes him the next badass super chosen one. Yeah! But he doesn't want to do his duties. He doesn't want to be the king because that's work. And it's truly remarkable how often when I've looked up other reviews of this book now that I've read it, how pe everyone describes Tristan as a man-child. It's just like universally the words that come to mind are man-child. And I agree because he's 30, which could be an interesting angle to this character, having him be a bit older than most protagonists we meet, most chosen one types. Like, you know, they're typically in late teens, early 20s. But instead, the author just decided to have him act like a 12-year-old. That's doing a disservice to some 12-year-olds I've met. I'm not even lying. He's so dumb. And his mentor, who's fiercely loyal to the prince, Wig, a clear Gandalf knockoff, like just Gandalf diet, that's Wig, is so loyal to him. And so many points in this book, I'm like, why? This guy's the worst. If he was going to inherit the kingdom I worked for, I would kill him because he's awful. At several points, he just puts, you know, the whole royal line in jeopardy and charges into danger recklessly because, you know, protagonist. But there's never any ramifications. Nothing bad happens to this guy for being a complete idiot. As the plot progresses, I'm just gonna get into spoilers because don't read this book, it's awful, and also you can probably predict every single thing I'm about to say. He has a sister who's, you know, the, oh, lovable princess, so sweet. She's like a little gumdrop of sugar in your mouth. She's the sweetest little thing ever. Guess what? She's kidnapped by the evil sorceresses who gnomes play a huge role here. I just want to add a note. Of all the fantasy races to play a big role, why gnomes? I don't have a hatred for gnomes, but why specifically gnomes? But she's kidnapped, of course, Prince, gotta go save her. So him, go off, get his sister back. Okay, this journey, the journey. Oh, I, hmm, you know me. You've watched a few of my videos, I hope. You know I like exposition dumps. Like, I'm okay with them. I like them to be layered within the text, but I'm a Robert Jordan fan. I'm okay with world building. As long as there is the minimal effort to tie it into the text. Not here. This story is Tristan going up to people, their cardboard cutouts of characters, and when he needs them to, they just hit play on the recorder, duct tape back to the cardboard cutout, and they just dump the exposition he'll need. That's the book. It's unreal to me that this got published in the state it's in. Not just because of that, but also the prose. One of the big things that's like 101 that an editor will give you is cut down on adjectives and stuff like that. Just condense because great prose are about beauty and simplicity. Someone didn't tell Robert that, and instead we have just so many 
adjectives. So many adjectives, why? Yeah, this is still me holding back. And trust me, my anger is gonna make a lot more sense in a minute. And then once the story reaches its inevitable get to the end climax, we have so much world-breaking things that go down, which is truly incredible. This author pulled off a magic trick, I'm not even kidding, where he spends most of this book just vomiting information at you, which most of it won't stick in the first place because it's like the most bland, flavorless oatmeal of storytelling you've ever experienced. And then the other half doesn't matter because the author's just gonna start breaking the rules he established for his magic system and world just whenever it's convenient to him, so don't pay attention. It literally doesn't matter. I'm talking like we're told at one point, oh, you physically cannot get there in time to save them. Oh, why don't we just invent a whole new magical way to get there faster? Good, we're gonna do that. Problem solved. Continuing on. Stakes are still a thing, we promise. I have absolutely no idea how someone could tell this story and find it to be like a compelling, interesting narrative. It's delivered in the most sloppy, bland, no effort put into it whatsoever, just dumps. You are sitting tied to a chair and someone is backing up a dump truck of flavorless sand onto you and just pouring it. How you manage to have so much exposition and monologuing with zero depth is truly impressive. Okay, so the plot is basically nothing. It's just we go get the woman. Just blah, 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 and it takes hundreds of pages to get going. There is so much fluff and filler in here. Every time like the author clearly had an interesting idea, it just gets lost in the piles and piles of just completely disregarded heaps of trash on top of everything else. And then there's the way he wrote female characters. Now, every time I bring up like sexism in writing or representation, I inevitably get the incoherent, misspelled, long-winded comments about how representation is bad, diversity is bad, I hate you, blah, blah, blah. This book is so sexist, I think it might even bother those people. Because this author, I'm not exaggerating, has every single female character who's not directly tied into a man as their most important like attribute be a awful, horrible person. If you're not first and foremost a sister, wife, mother, or daughter, you're a bad person. Also, women are more corruptible by magic. Why? Because they need to be. Because the author didn't get his I hate this. I hate this so much. It's so bad. It's so bad. Oh, and the main villains, these sorceresses, they're evil, and part of the reason why they're so evil is because they like sex, and their sexuality is an awful thing. Because God forbid, if a woman likes sex, she's just the worst. On top of everything I've said here, also, Sexual assault in this book happens page after page. Sometimes it's treated as not legitimate sexual assault because someone didn't climax, things along those lines. Horrendous portrayals. There also is the corruption of his sister by these sorceresses, turning her into the fifth sorceress, where now, oh, guess what comes along with being evil? She's bisexual now. Oh no, because apparently that's part of being evil and is an evil trait. Like, it's so transparently homophobic and sexist, where he's implying any women who embrace their sexuality in any way is somehow corrupt. Women need to be either just related to a man under their protection. Like, I'm not reading into this. It is blatantly on top of, like, everything. And it's hammered home again and again. Of course, everyone wants to jump the bones of our main protagonist to the point where he's the victim of sexual assault repeatedly. And it's like, why, why do lazy authors depend on this so heavily? Why do lazy authors consistently depend on sexual assault to drive stakes and prove like evilness in their story? Are they so creatively bankrupt they can't think of anything outside of it? I'm not saying all usages of it are, you know, horrible and bad. No, there are ways you can write darker topics like this into text and it'd be relevant and important to the story. It is just certainly, without question, not here. It's just used as a, whoa, look how evil they are. Arr, it's happening. And then, oh, by the way, I never mentioned this at all. I also want to say violence in this book. It might sound like this is a lighthearted romp from the way I'm describing it. This is one of those books that's like focused on violence to a point where it's like, you didn't, no, nope, you didn't need the mass and violence on that level. It's, nope, def definitely was not required. Like, it, in, in a book like Prince of Thorns, it can serve a purpose because it's, you know, related to how messed up the protagonist is. But here, 
just seem to be enjoying writing it. I would be so embarrassed if I wrote this and put this out. I would feel so much shame. It's not just me saying this either. Look up most other reviews from credible sources. They're pointing out the real problems here. It is such a horrendous book when it comes to portraying women. Wow. Oh, and of course, while women can't go like off and do anything on their own agency and ambition, every man is of course noble and full of agency and mm, we're heroes. Yeah! It even goes so far. When we meet male characters, they're very often barely described. Like, they're not really given depth to their physical appearance much at all. Which is fine. It's a stylistic choice many authors use, and it's completely okay. If you just don't want to describe a lot of people physically, that's okay. But what if I told you that every time this author describes a female character, it's like the Looney Tunes wolf eyes thing, like... <laughs> it's essentially that. And also our main protagonist, Tristan, the ever awful, horrible piece of sh that he is, says I think three separate times that a woman is the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. Have you not seen w women b before? I know there's one most beautiful woman I've ever seen. It's certainly not three different ones in the span of like a month. Oh God. Now we're gonna enter another segment of this review I call baffling creative decisions that make me go, I already mentioned the gnome thing. Let's just reiterate that. Gnomes play a major role and... Dude, why gnomes? I'd, I'm sorry for my gnome fans out there. I just... Why gnomes? Also, our main protagonist invents throwing knives. Yes, you heard me right. This entire civilization was unaware of the art of knife throwing and Tristan comes up with it like it's this grand, amazing thing that... Mm, he's gonna, he's gonna be the best with. You know the, the thing we've been doing and hunting since the Stone Age? Since, since we first made knives? Tristan invents that. Tristan also plays fetch with a horse. I called a friend of mine to verify if this was possible. I, I just was reading a book and I need to know if something is possible with horses. Okay. The main character plays fetch with a horse. Is it possible? Yes. Okay, could you do it with a stick? Um, <laughs> with a stick would be pushing it. So they do play with sticks, but not really like dogs. Like fetch is kind of, they're more like the dogs that don't know how to play fetch, but still want to play with the, the stick where they'll pick it up and kind of run around and buck and kick a little bit, but not, not really fetch. Okay. But I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I hope you're doing well. You too. All right. Bye. Apparently it's kind of, but you need to like train the horse and it's not something they just do. So n no, a horse isn't just a giant dog. Also, Tristan, who's a grown ass man, as I've made abundantly clear, is defeated by a look behind your back. Yeah. Yeah. Also, this isn't really a creative choice, but more just like a sign of the laziness here. I think the author wanted to change the name of his currency at one point because he straight up, flat out, has it spelled two different ways with no justification. On half the pages, it's spelled one way, and on the other half, it's spelled another. So why is that a thing? I have absolutely no idea. It goes into my theory that there's no editor for this because I am baffled at how this got published in the way it is because it was put out by a real publisher who had to have read and reviewed it, right? This was published in a time before the self-publishing boom. I can't write it off as just like, oh, it just got put out there and eventually a publisher picked it up. No, this went through the process. So to summarize my thoughts here, my conclusion, if you would like to spend roughly 150 to 170 pages having exposition and backstory vomited down your throat in the most bland, just butter rubbing over your scalp, nothing's gonna stick, not even salted butter. This is the most bland story ever with one red hot chili pepper stuck in of a heaping serving of sexism, then this could be the book for you because the last chunk is the most generic execution of a fantasy plot you could come across full of just plot conveniences, contrivances, and a wickedly boring character who will just drive you nuts when he's not just coming across like oatmeal with no sugar. Not even raisins. 
There's not even raisins in that oatmeal. How you manage to do this much info dumping with no resulting depth of world is extraordinarily impressive. There is just a scaffolding sitting here and we were charged all these pages to set up this scaffolding. And at the end of the day, there is no building it's wrapped around. It's just the scaffolding. Oh, and so much of it is repetitive, like repetitive, 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 repetitive. I'm giving it a zero out of 10 for world building, a one out of 10 for character, a zero out of 10 for plot, a zero out of 10 for pacing, a zero out of 10 for magic system, just due to the fact that it breaks its own laws all the time. And overall, I'm feeling for the fifth sorceress, a zero out of 10. Don't read it, it's not worth your time. I'm genuinely upset it took up some of mine. I have so many other great books to get to. And like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my two latest high tier Patreons, Grace Booyer and James Hayden. Hope you guys are having a great one. Peace.